Hey everyone, welcome to the Swick Podcast, talk about business and AI. We are two veteran Googlers. This is my co-host Joe Trinasky, VP of Eng, and I am Jordan Thibodeau, M&A professional. If you like business AI with a dash of humor, uh, this is your show. If you also like middle of the road takes, like we, we love technology, but we're also not like the singularity is tomorrow. It's going to happen. Sell all your worldly possessions. <laughs> and we're also not with the camp of Terminators tomorrow. You're going to die. If you're the camp of AI is cool, you want to see awesome, great technology, then this is your show. So uh, we're going to first do a reaction to um, David Shapiro's uh, last video. Now, let's first start off. Uh, David Shapiro, I think he's a good dude. Um, he is pro-technology. He likes AI. We appreciate that. Um, he does have some good takes here and there. And uh, we appreciate what he's doing. Um, but we also we also look at some of the things he's doing and we, we say to ourselves, Hey, um, well, I do, uh, maybe some things are kind of getting out there. And what we wanted to do is do a quick, um, reaction to, uh, some of the stuff. So let's start with the first clip here. First is general knowledge. Uh, this is going to be a machine, a model, an architecture that, that basically knows everything that humans know. And well, Chat GPT, GPT-4, Gemini, Llama-3, these pretty much are already trained on most human knowledge. Now, there is obviously a lot of human knowledge that it did not glean from the internet, and this is where you see uh, companies like Microsoft, OpenAI, and Google scraping the, the bottom of the barrel for literally all knowledge that they can get their hands on, including by signing deals with news agencies and so on, because there is a lot of knowledge that is uh, transmitted directly from human to human, such as in universities. Not everything is in books, or not all books are available, not all videos are available, and that sort of thing. So, but we're getting close. And what's interesting is we already have the algorithmic capability of integrating all knowledge. We just need to get access to the data. The second thing is advanced mathematics. And so this is one of the big... So I didn't do the very beginning of that clip, but he's basically saying what his definition of uh, what AGI is. And I think he's really lowering the bar by... If you, if you look at his definition... It, you know, it says access to this broader understanding of most humans across various domains. And you could almost say, if you look at just basic Google search, based on his definition, Google search is that. It, yes, it doesn't give you, it doesn't understand unstructured data, but you can get access to any information around across the globe and you can read it. It's not understanding it for you. So I thought his definition is kind of watered down because I have always looked at it as AGI as this is in uh, a machine that is self-directed, can do its own form of long-term planning, can reorientate itself and take action without humans. And I think yep. the way he's defining it in seven months is very watered down. Um, so yeah. I would love to hear what your thoughts are, Joe. I like your analogy to Google search and, and that was Google's mission, right? to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful. And they definitely made a, made a great step towards organizing the world's information and making it available. I mean, books, web pages, video, all kind of crazy piles of information suddenly were available if you could construct the right search. Uh, I think they sort of stalled on the making it useful part. That's the part that we're really getting to now. Uh, I agree with your point about him maybe lowering the bar on AGI. And I've noticed that now we're talking about both AGI and ASI, which is an uh, artificial super intelligence. Interesting. Uh, there was a nice framework put out by, I think, DeepMind describing the different levels of artificial intelligence going from, you know, barely crawling up through godlike, you know, does everything on its own, fully autonomous, smarter than everybody on the planet, and so on. And I think where Shapiro is describing things is this level they call competent, where they basically say the artificial intelligence can beat 50%, like the average person, on a large variety of tasks. It can't beat specialists on their tasks, and it still can't beat 50% of the people even on the average tasks. So to me, that's not really an AGI. It's like, we don't want something that can just do as well as the average person on average jobs, because generally that sucks. Like nobody would be satisfied if, you know, if, if Google search results came back as like the average of what I would remember about something, nobody would be happy about that, right? They expect Google search results to be authoritative and complete and accurate. They, you know, they measure precision and recall and all this crazy stuff. So. 
I think what people are expecting from a sort of mid-level AGI is still a little better than the average person. The second thing I would say is, to your point, there's a huge amount of scaffolding or framing or plumbing around the agent that we don't have yet. Like right now, the agent can engage in a chat conversation. Okay, well, that's great, but that's a fairly limited sandbox, right? Like it can't jump out of this chat conversation and go take action on my behalf. That's what a system like Multion or the other agents are trying to do. And I would expect that as an extension. Like my guess is someone in OpenAI is working on making chat GPT able to put up a little notice and say, hey, this thing we're discussing, do you want me to go do that for you right now on your desktop? And at some point you'll be able to say, yeah, go try to do that. And they'll try their best to pull it off with an agent. So I feel like that scaffolding is still missing and it kind of makes the agent less useful in a practical way. So I think that's a requirement for what I would call AGI. It has to at least make an effort to do the work for me, not just talk about it. Hey everyone, if you head over to patreon.com forward slash fic for five bucks a month, you get access to our exclusive episodes. We produce three per week. They are ad free and we cross post them on YouTube too. Um, so for five bucks a month, you get access to this and we cover various topics. Um, the last one we, we created was about AI agents and also how to write better prompts. So you can get more out of chat GPT and Gemini. Uh, we did an episode also on pricing AI and market strategy. We've done episodes on what's going on in commercial real estate, all these awesome topics and we release three of them per week. And so for five bucks a month, you get access and you can view them on Patreon or you can view them on YouTube. So go to patreon.com forward slash fic and support the show. Talk to you later. Bye. Exactly. And I, I sweep the leg, no mercy. Uh, I agree with everything you said there. Um, and right now, even the agents we have, we're basically doing different calls of LLMs at different levels. Um, and it's very brittle. Um, and it, it <laughs> It's it's awesome. It's the best technology I've seen in my lifetime. That's why we have the show going on. But I agree with everything you said said there. So definitely. Yeah, plus it's funny one. coming from us because we're such enthusiasts, right? We're both totally positive on this. We love it. We want to see it keep developing, but we wouldn't get carried away and just say that it's AGI already. Exactly, and that's the difference between our show and his show. And I ah. think his show is what he's doing is like he's playing the Ray Kurzweil, where he goes like, "Oh, like in the future." We're eventually have systems that are going to take over everything we're doing. It's like, obviously, yes, that's the trajectory of life that's going to happen. Uh, but difference is, we're pragmatists saying there's a lot of steps between then and there. You don't just as Peter Thiel said. I was trying to get a clip. Peter Thiel thinks that people like him are just you put on your 3D glasses and eat popcorn. And the future just happens. It's like no, there's a lot of steps to get there, and there's <laughs> A lot of examples in human history where societies have been ready to go next step and they have passed laws and regulation and said, stop, we're not going to go any further. Like, There's definitely going to be people trying to block progress on this. And I, I think you're right about his perception of, of progress in the video. He, he refers to the exponential curve and how when you're on such a curve, the curve looks the same at every point, which is true. Uh, and when you think something is halfway to being done, that means it's basically going to be done tomorrow because of the way the curve works. So it's very misleading to us because we're used to linear progress, right? And an exponential is just outside of our, our experience and our way of thinking. Uh, the other thing I would throw in there is what you said about brittleness is right on target. These models currently have really limited ability to recover from even the most minor mistakes early in a multi-step process. So if they make a mistake at step one and there's six steps to go, they just, it's like hopeless past that point. You might as well just push reset and start over. And even a fairly below average person has a chance to recover when they've made a mistake in a process like that. So I would say, I would expect to see that for AGI. The other thing is, and this maybe is beyond AGI and falling into their definition of uh, ASI, I guess. I would expect that the models would start to make contributions to the development of the next generation of models. They would advise on the architecture. They would advise on training. They would help you make improvements basically to themselves. Uh, and that might be, you know, direct kind of recursive effect, like model uh, GPT-4 is commenting on how to design GPT-5, or it might be indirect, like, you know, GPT-4 is helping to design model X that's for doing design of more models, and then Model X helps us design GPT-5. So either way, 
That's the kind of thing you see with silicon compilers, right? People use desktop systems. They write code. They design chips. The code they're writing is more tools to help them design more chips, including things that sort of compile your design into a chip layout, applying all kinds of rules about how to make it more efficient in the process. So there you see there's still a human in the loop, but basically the tools are helping you build the next generation of the product and of the tools. So you get this, what they call a flywheel effect in business. The last exactly. thing I wanted to comment on was your point about uh, the way he's framing progress. I think uh, we generally agree with him on the direction of the progress and maybe even on the rough timeline. Like, you know, it's going to be sometime in the next century. Uh, but most things in technology sort of go through this Gartner hype cycle where we get all carried away and everyone gets totally inflated in their expectations. And then there's a horrible crash and they call it the trough of disillusionment where we all say, oh, that didn't turn out the way we thought and it, all, and it totally sucks. And then there's this long, slow, I forget what they call it, the slope of enlightenment. There's some other name where things gradually recover and eventually they end up where we thought they were going to end up. It just takes longer than we originally thought. And I don't think this generation of AI has gone through that process yet. I don't know that it's going to, but it's there's a good chance it does. Exactly. Sweep the leg. No mercy. Um, I, I agree with all of that. And you also mentioned Multion. We're going to have the Multion, uh, one of the founders on the show in, in the first week of March. They're doing some really good work to talk about cool. this. But everything you've put together, like I, I completely agree. And um, I also think what I don't like about some of these guys, and not throwing shade, like I said, if I could clone him, if I could clone David a thousand times over for everyone you'd, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Like I think you does more damage than anything than for, for AI progress than the constant doomerism. Um, I what I don't like though is uh, you set people up for his expectation of everything's gonna be great tomorrow and then it's gonna turn out it's most likely not gonna be great tomorrow. Yeah. Um, that's, that's why you go hedging. through that that cycle he's of hype and disillusionment. Yeah, right? and he's he's, he he's hedging his age he's he's watering down his AGI terms because like let's just say by the end of the year, AI agents aren't deployed in enterprises, large companies fully yet. We have to be prepared that that could be a possibility. But then, if you have folks who are already pushing for singularity tomorrow, um, they're going to then open up space for more disillusionment. And so we want to be, as I I hate the consulting term, and I don't like using it in stock either. I guess optimistic, but also grounded in reality. Um, so let's go to the next. Um, the next clip he has here, which is on 1132. Let's go here. So he's got to know something that other people don't, which leads to, has AGI been achieved internally? This has been speculation for a while. Um, now, when, when you saw some of the, the board members of OpenAI say, basically, it would be better to shut down OpenAI than allow it to continue as is. Like, what, what were the stakes? Why, why, were they that, why were they that angry or that anxious about whatever they were doing? And so either they had AGI or they, they were on the path to AGI. Now, it's also possible that there are profit motives. There's been lots of speculation videos out there where it's like, oh, hey, we have an opportunity. Okay, so when people either do e e for everyone, like mental heuristic, when people do either or, they're doing an old trial lawyer's technique and putting mm -hmm. you on a path. It's like they either have AGI or they or they're on the path of AGI. Right. It's like they're offering you a false choice. Like these are the all, only two offering, alternatives. He's offering a false <clears throat> choice. So let, let's continue mm -hmm. real quick. To torpedo our competitor, who knows? Um, it didn't work, um, and and here we are, you know, six months later, and their open AI is stronger than ever. Sam Altman is stronger than ever. Either, either they have achieved it or they they have triangulated and they know where AGI is. They know how to get there. They know what the final steps are. Um, and that gives me a lot of hope, actually, because like just reading the tea leaves, looking out there, what everyone is doing, I wouldn't be surprised if they either if they either have AGI or they've got a roadmap and they're only like a few steps away from it. Okay, so again, um, I, I know he said he's been in the industry, but me and Joe have been in the industry for a while. Um, <laughs> everything everything leaks like a fucking sieve in these large companies. Yep. Everything leaks. Yep. Now, if they had AGI. That would have leaked tomorrow. But more importantly, as we explained in previous videos, if I'm the Pentagon, if I'm the CIA, if I'm cyber defense, I have my plans to that organization already. And you have good justification on how to turn people. You have conversations on the side with them. My dad used to work uh, internal private security for, um, um, for um, National Semiconductor. Um, and he wasn't the standard FBI. Like, look, you wouldn't even tell he was part of it. But there's ways of asking questions of people uh, who work in these companies without even them knowing that they're working with government agents to get the right intel that you want out. And 
if they had AGI, our government already would have known this, and they would have nationalized this, or this organization already. <laughs> Dude, um, San Francisco's got to be crawling with agents from different national governments at, the, at this point. I mean, yeah. they have to be trying to infiltrate every single one of these AGI companies from every major intelligence organization. Uh, you're, you're, you're so true. One of my buddies, um, he works for a uh, – he does mechanical engineering, a defense contractor, and there's an FBI agent here for just San Francisco. And he meets with all the engineers from different companies and says, China has a program where they get their best and brightest who are coming out of university. And on year three or four, they say, hey, how would you like to support the mainland? We mm -hmm. want you to go to an American company and work there and do really hard. And then when you're done, come back. And we will pay you a king's ransom for you to tell us everything they have going on inside their organization. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone came to me and said, uh, I don't know, someone in the CIA or Pentagon was like, hey, Jordan, national security, we need you to go to somewhere in South America, join the company, and then learn as much as possible because this company has information that could put our democracy at risk. And they lay out a really good case. Mm -hmm. One would be hard pressed to say, no, I'm not going to help my nation and my country. So, we have China doing things like that already. It's not, it's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, I definitely know our government's doing something in, in that regards, um, and they also have done it in forms of the Peace Corps. But they also have a. I know they have people inside of OpenAI who are tracing what's going on right now. The reason why, and uh, he also mentions. Let me let me play this a little more before I get off the track. Sorry. And so this will explain all the research acceleration that we're seeing out there, all of the huge amounts of investments, you know, Anthropic and, and, and Microsoft and Llama 3 and everyone, they're all pouring billions and billions of dollars into it. So you remember how Meta was like, you know, we're going to build the Metaverse and Metaverse and Metaverse and, and, um, and Mark Zuckerberg like almost bankrupted the company. I think like they went down like 10% in value or more because he's like, we're going to build the Metaverse. And now he's like, actually throws that out. We're going to do AGI. Um, he's probably still going to do the Metaverse because, you know, MetaQuest 3 and all that fun stuff. But once many, many, you know, tech billionaires all line up on the same thing, once they converge, you know, something is happening behind the scenes. Okay. So he actually, and uh, I, I like the dude. Um, we're not trying to throw shade, but he actually made an argument <laughs> against what he was making for. Zuckerberg went all in buying Oculus Rift, VR is it. And then every other tech company, because of the fear of missing out, mm -hmm. threw, threw all their money in VR too. Google did stupid cardboard shit. They made their own glasses. Um, you then have now Facebook's doing Vision Pro and people are already returning it. Um, you had and Apple's different doing companies their, involved. Their goggles. Exactly. And so just the fact that everyone's throwing money at something doesn't mean that someone knows a secret inside. Just like when hedge funds all get excited about a certain stock and they all start pumping it up. What happens is the game is, is that, well, Mark Zuckerberg decided by Oculus, he must be smart. He must know something. So then the VP inside of Google goes, well, they must know I mean, this. If these billionaires market. were always right, we'd be riding yeah. segways and using Amazon Fire phones. Just sweep the leg, no mercy. Really. I mean, they really fuck up all the time. You know, they, mm -hmm. they get ideas from each other. They hedge their bets. They try to be in several things that might work, but they do it in a, in a stochastic way, right? They place bets like they're playing poker and they place multiple bets. I mean, Microsoft's got bets all over the place and so does Google. Well said. You know, just don't want to miss out. They can be supervised and they can be held accountable. Um, but then as the companies get better at deploying agents in those spaces, then they'll be kind of watered down for consumer grade. And by the way, for my, my career in IT, yes, all the corporations have access to the Chinese toys that are, that are unlocked with no governors or whatever. Because, um, you know, if, if a company signs a contract saying, hey, we're going to pay you $500 million for the software for this capability, take the, take the shackles off, take the governor off, guess what? The tech billionaires are going to take the shackles off. For the consumer grade stuff, you don't get the, un, you don't get the unfiltered. Beyond. Okay, he's making the argument that there's a super version of GPT-4 that's full agent and it's just taking over work and and destroying things and kicking ass. It's That's like, right. There's some no. pure cocaine in a big bag that only the billionaires have access to. We just get the stuff that's been heavily cut. <laughs> this is why we're brothers, Joe. We always, we all, we always mix in a good drug reference. We always cut it up in there. Like a good thing. If, a good I mean, that's the way people are thinking, right? They're thinking yeah. there's like this, this pure drip of just fantastic stuff. Um, exactly. I, I think he's generally right that enterprise customers can call the tune. That's part of enterprise sales, which is a whole other topic. But it's got nothing to do with AGI. It's a complete distraction. Exactly. The, the, he, he could have made the argument of like, yeah, Anthropic was given first to enterprises, and then begrudgingly they did a, a clod because ChatGPT forced their hand. But it, they, you're right. They didn't, no, hey, here's the working Skynet. <laughs> Not only that, but we're getting into all kinds of wacky conspiracy theories here, which is where you got to bring out the Star Trek shirt. I, mean, I know this is what they have exactly. AGI internally or they know how to get it and they're just not telling us. No, if you go into one of these companies, you, first of all, you got massive confusion. 
You got people pointing in all kinds of directions who are all vying for, you know, primacy and promotion. They've all got different ideas. They're all pissed off that their project is not getting the right amount of resources that they think it deserves. They're all fighting over who's in charge. Number two, you got all kinds of people pointing in different directions about what's going to happen. I mean, if you're the CEO, guaranteed at least once a day and probably more, someone comes to you with some crazy idea and says, oh, this idea is really important. If we don't do it, it could mean our entire company falls behind you know, competitor X. Like, like they lay that in front of you and then they walk away. And as the CEO, you're like, okay, this is the fourth time this week that some existential threat has been brought to my attention. What the fuck am I supposed to do? If I jump and apply resources to every existential threat that shows up, we would never do a good job of anything. We would just be watered down and just doing mediocre work all over the place. That's the CEO's that, dilemma. And, and the CEO knows that he might say, I'm not worried about this. And then two years later, it might turn out to be a real problem. And then the public will turn to the CEO and say, we heard somebody inside your company told you this was a risk. Why didn't you listen? As if the CEO is an idiot. So true. Sweep the leg, no mercy. I, I would hit the media board, but I can't because it's broken. Uh, Riverside. <laughs> you, uh, you've been hitting it too often or too hard? It's just too hard. It's like, no more. It just doesn't work anymore. Um, the, the, the product manager is going to get me in some alpha tests, so he's a good dude. Um, but you're so right. It, 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 uh, you, you just eventually, what is it? Um, it's not learned hopelessness. It is you become, um, what's the feeling when... God, I wish I knew how to speak English, but basically I'm getting at is you become numb, numb. You become yes. numb constantly. Yes. Like think of all the poor VPs last five years ago were like, crypto, did you hear Bology? Bology saying crypto is everything. We need to, okay, so I know I'm the CTO for the Catholic Church, but we need like Christ coins. Christ That's coins right. Christ is what coins. we really need. <laughs> Let's do Christ coins. It's like, and then the the the, the Catholic Church is like, uh, like, why do we need this? Because blockchain, <laughs> blockchain, that's why the blockchain. And so it's all going to be on the blockchain. I heard that exactly. a couple years ago. And so what's going on is uh, the reason why startups and opening eye can move so quickly is instead of having just one large organization with a bureaucracy up top who's calling the shots, you have millions of small companies who are going all in on all these wacky ideas and 99.9999% fail, but you never hear about them. But then one, like OpenAI is successful and it dug in and got God's lottery ticket. And now it's moving so quickly because it has a head start on all this stuff. So you're right. The bureaucracy aspect of coordinating so many different people to get onto an idea and the idea of like, there's a conspiracy yeah. going on. Just like the, the these government. are, these are points that uh, Nassim Taleb makes really well in um, fooled by randomness and the black swan. Mm -hmm. You know, he describes these, you have all these these hedge fund managers or mutual fund managers making investments and they're all talking about how their performance is great. And of course, they're cherry picking their performance numbers. And of course, they're not talking about all the funds that they closed that had horrible numbers. You're only seeing the remaining funds that that survived to this point. If you went back and really honestly looked at their performance, including all the times that that didn't work, you know, it wouldn't make good marketing copy. Exactly. And the game that they do is... Um, uh, like Morgan Stanley or whatnot, will have $15 million and they will get 20 newbie hedge fund managers and they mm -hmm. all seed them stakes. And mm -hmm. then of those 15 hedge fund managers, 14 fail and then one makes it. And then mm -hmm. Morgan Stanley will give them more money and then get on the phone to Joe and say, hey, look at this hedge fund manager's track record. Last year has been really kick-ass. Give us some more money and you'll do mm -hmm. even better. But odds mm -hmm. are past performances and guaranteeing future results. And so now Joe is out of, two, out of some money. Uh, well, let's I mean, you have regression one. to the mean, right? Exactly. Uh, let's you go have survivorship one. bias on the front and then regression right. to the mean on the back. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful business. We should get into it. Don't forget to like <laughs> and subscribe. Okay. John Water Downing. Now, what I will say, the saving grace for all this is there's open source projects for all of these open source robots, open source models, open source agent frameworks. So if you want it, you can get the unfiltered version. There's plenty of AI, uh, other AI channels out there that talk about the fully uncensored models and you'll get fully uncensored robots too. So this technology seems like it is intrinsically more democratized, which is a really good thing to avoid this cyberpunk future that I always am talking about. Now we are gearing up for the arrival of AGI and there's going to be a few barriers to adoption. And there's actually one barrier that I forgot to mention here. And that is just the constraints of chips. Um, but I kind of alluded to that with Sam Alton looking for $7 trillion to make more chips. But what I'm focusing on here with these barriers of adoption is the human barriers of adoption. So first and foremost, large organizations have a hard time pivoting. When you've got 10,000 employees or 80,000 employees in you know, 200 offices around the world, that's a lot of infrastructure to update and pivot. 
and it is a huge uh, it is a huge lift and shift effort. There's also just a tremendous amount of skepticism and ignorance out there. Uh, most CEOs are in a wait and see approach, and this is to be expected. And this is true of all technological changes, uh, and it follows a natural distribution or a bell curve where you've got early adopters, you've got late adopters. And one thing that actually surprises most people is that I'm actually kind of a late majority adopter usually, because having been in the tech space for a long time, it's just it's exhausting if you want to try and keep up on the top trends of everything. There's also a huge fear of job loss, and so there's an interesting study that I saw recently that showed that the more that employees use AI tools, the more they start to fear for their jobs. And basically, the way that it works is if you understand that the AI is doing most of your cognitive heavy lifting, then all you need is something an AI to replace you to steer the other AIs, and that's actually pretty much how it works. The more that you a lot of jumps to conclusion there. You could actually make that same case for any technology in human history. Um, yes. It's AI uh, is all the way down. You just need one AI, to coordinate them. So true. Um, it's like did, did the accountants, once they started using Excel on their laptops or on their on their PCs and bookkeepers using the same, all of a sudden assume, oh, now QuickBooks is going to come in and take me over. I'm done. No, what usually happens is like, oh. All that drudgery really of me doing manual handwritten ledgers, I can now focus more time on <clears> clients <throat> and make more money. He tries so, to make that I, point about agriculture, you know, saying that we went from 99% of the people being employed in agriculture down to 3%. I think it's actually smaller than that now. But that's a good point, right? Because we saw a very nice evolution with agriculture being mechanized and automated, right? It's also funny because everyone starts yelling and screaming about, oh, we're gonna, everyone's going to lose their job. We went through the agriculture revolution, we went through the industrial revolution, people shifted to other, to doing other things essentially. And to your point, many of them continued on in the old thing. They were just massively more productive. So they didn't need as many people. I also made a fun point there about resource constraints, which was really interesting. It's like, on the one hand, you're talking about exponential curves. Exponential curves are growth rate description. Assuming that nothing gets in your way, that is no resources constrained, right? No process, no, no uh, input to the, to the system is constrained in any way. But there's always resource constraints. If something starts ramping up, you eventually run out of something. It's like, in this case, you run out of chips. You'll probably also run out of researchers because right now the researchers are the ones building models and training them. And there's only so many of them available. So... What I would say is, before you draw an exponential curve, you have to ask yourself, what are all the resources that are necessary for this process I'm describing, and how are they limited? Exactly. What's the constraint? And then also, what's the, cons the major constraint? The constraint of change for overall society. Um, they're very well. Governments come out and say, he, stop, nix this, yeah. too quick. He goes you into know, that a little bit, talking about mm -hmm. you know rules that governments might apply, and also about... <clears throat> you know, labor unions opposing it or people afraid for their jobs. I'm sure all of those things will try to slow down the introduction of a new technology. They always seem to. Um, and then following on from that, he mentions the problem of pivoting a large corporation with 10,000 people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that kind of goes counter to your comp conspiracy ideas about how these companies know how to do this already. And they're, they're just, I don't know, for whatever reason, they're keeping it for themselves or they're still... Uh, carrying out their master plan. Any company bigger than 10,000 people is a disaster to coordinate. I mean, it's just a nightmare. Exactly. And Joe, ma imagine if me and you were senior executives of the company and we're like, hey, we have this technology that allows us to get rid of 90% of our workforce and would juice our earnings. Do you think the CEO would be like, oh, <laughs> actually, no, let's not do this because I don't want to get loaded and be made a god to wall street no 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 we're gonna hold off on this technology put it away get get your box like the end of raiders of the lost ark we'll put your technology and idea in it and have our top <laughs> men top men are working on this as we speak put All it right, in the warehouse continue. where no one will ever find it exactly that you use ai to do your job the more that, that activity can be recorded and observed and then it's like oh well we can actually automate that and you might think that it requires a significant amount of judgment in order to you know, switch between those tasks and know what plugs into what, um, but you're just a cog in a machine uh, and the company wants to get rid of you because you're expensive to employ. Um, now that fear of job loss is, is creating a lot of resistance and friction, um, even at very high levels. Like there are, there are C-level, like C-suite and um, other people, they're also afraid of it. And so they're resistant. They've got their kind of head in the sand um, saying, oh, well, AI isn't really that big of a deal because literally everyone is worried about their jobs. Um, you know, for some context, the UPS layoffs, it was 12,000 middle managers. So these are people that, that you think would be highly resistant because they have a lot of people skills. They sit in a lot of meetings. They talk to a lot of people. They do a lot of hiring, um, but they were not immune. Um, so, and then there's Okay, so uh, that was a really good one. Um, UPS has a history of doing layoffs, um, and um, I was looking more into this. And in 2022, UPS took steps to reduce its workforce in regions where delivery demand had softened. Um, they ended up getting rid of uh, middle managers back then. UPS also did significant restructuring back in 2010. 
they it, it's part of the, the hiring and uh, the, the seasonality of their business. Before Christmas, you hire a ton, a shit ton of people. After Christmas is over, you get rid of them. You also probably have some aspects of overhang from the COVID lockdowns. Um, so you can't just AI making the decisions. Um, yes, there's places for AI to make things much more efficient. We're seeing on just like sales and marketing and HR as far as project plans and doing copy and whatnot. But you have AI there making management decisions. Um, so I think he's drawing. I like your point people, earlier but, about uh, chief whatever officers, you know, seeing this technology and being kind of enthusiastic, like, oh, we could we could get rid of some of our people and optimize things. I don't I don't necessarily think of them as being, you know, mean about it. Like they want to lay people off because they know they're going to catch heat for it and it's not a nice thing to do. Mm hmm. But if they see that they could make their processes more efficient, however you frame it, do more with the same people or reduce the number of people they need, I don't think the chief executive officers are going to shy away from that because they're worried about their own jobs. No, that's not how they operate. They're going to take advantage of anything they can use to improve their financial results that they have to report every quarter because that's how their bonuses are paid. And that's how they exactly. think. That's how they got into their roles. They're not afraid of a new technology. They're just skeptical of whether it can do what it's promised to do. 100% because their ass, like if they went like, look, we, we're like, I got just got access to multi-on. I'm happier to pig and shit. I was telling Joe last <laughs> night, like, I got multi-on access. Hell yeah, bro. Let's go. And we have a video on that. And I didn't say it that terms like I'm a little kid. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, <laughs> but I know for a fact there's going to be some bugs in it. It's just the way it is. Now, for those VPs, if they went and just said, let's just deploy something like this, and there's going to be bugs in it, they're the people, mm -hmm. they're the throat to choke. They're the ones getting hanged. Just like when Apple Maps came out like seven or eight years ago, and there were some bugs, uh, Tim Apple immediately turned to their one of the VPs and said, you need to hang for this. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Even though the VP's like, it wasn't my, sorry, we need a scapegoat. That's the way it is. Now, also, <laughs> things are not in a vacuum. Do you for every so the higher you get up the ladder, the more creakier it gets. It doesn't ah. just get cr creakier for the sake of it. Is it's that there's less and less spots in the tournament. Now, if you someone brings you technology that says we are going to be able to reduce headcount by ninety percent, and you say, hmm, no, let's not do it. Political pressure. If mm -hmm. I'm that person underneath you, and I have this golden ticket, hmm, wow. Somehow, an anonymous email went to the CEO saying, hey, if I was in charge, I could juice your earnings per share by orders of magnitude higher, but the current VP is just a pussy, and that's not why we're doing it. So if you give me the job, then I'll take care of business for you. You think the CEO is going to be like, yeah, no, sorry, I'm not going to juice revenue for that? No, they're going to tell that senior VP, hey, you know, it's time for you to go spend time with your family. It's Game Jordan's of Thrones out there. Exactly. Yeah. So those good ideas, it, it, people are fighting for your spot. So it's a, it's a tough spot. Being a VP. We, 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 we dog on VPs. There's a lot of good VPs and we support them. There's a lot of bad VPs too, but it's a tough game to play. Well, this is so also what uh, innovation and you know, theory is all about, right? We're waiting for us. If a big company is not going to do it, we look to startups to introduce the idea. And the startups got all kinds of disadvantages. That, you know, the big company has all the existing customers and all the relationships. So the startup's got a lot working against it. But on the other hand, the startup is very happy to use the new idea that the big company is hesitant to use. Hell yeah. And that's why we like, we like open markets and competition because Google, mm -hmm. Google, played, Google played their games for eight years. They and had, that's why we don't get upset about failure, right? We say, well, yeah. three companies exactly. tried three different approaches. Two of them failed. That's okay. Exactly. Um, I think uh, going back to uh, Nassim Talib, who we won in the show, um, he said we should have a day of uh, – we have Veterans Day, which is the highest holiday we should ce celebrate. But then we need a holiday, which is nowhere in comparison to Veterans Day. But it's still a holiday, and the holiday is for all the people who attempted something and failed and lost their net worth or looked at as idiots. Those That failure is needed for society to progress because if you don't have people who are brave enough to risk it – and I'm not saying you should go YOLO everything on options right now. But if you have people who are willing to risk something, you're not going to get new ideas that's going to turn to productivity and it's going to lead to better, a better lives for everyone. So mm -hmm. let's go mm -hmm. to the next, this next point. Big time conspiracy theorists, but I have been studying rhetoric, narratives, and propaganda, and this is just the way things work. The government wants to push AI. 
Well, the way that you push AI is you make it, you downplay its risks. And we've seen this, you know, the government always downplays inflation, for instance. So just replace inflation with AI. That's exactly what they're doing right there. They're like, no, it's not that bad. It's not that big a deal, but we want to double down on it. And so the question is why? The primary. Okay. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but um, <laughs> I'm not a racist, but I'm not a sexist, but. <laughs> so I, it's a bad I'm not saying he's, a, he's not saying any of that, but he's contradicting himself because he's basically saying that there's the government is super well coordinated on the inside when it's not super well coordinated. And they're keeping on uh, some agenda. When I thought the quote was, it's like, don't just ascribe like a dark conspiracy when it's much easier to ascribe just ignorance. And mm -hmm. it's the government just, just doesn't know how to run it. I'm not right. going to go into anything right. about certain people. Don't in ascribe the conspiracy yeah. what's better talked up to ignorance. There you go. Thank you, Joe. You can or incompetence. Let's go. Exactly. Let's go to the <clears> next <throat> one. Um, I think actually in this government thing, a better point to make would be that there are likely people inside the government, especially in the national security side, who are worried about AI being developed by other uh, competing countries. Like, I would expect that China is spending quite a bit to try to develop a AI, AGI, and they seem to be making pretty good progress. I mean, there are a lot of interesting papers coming out of Chinese companies and, and universities. Uh, and they have a lot of talented uh, computer scientists and mathematicians. And they're graduating way more people in those fields than the US or Europe. I mean, it's not even close. So I would say if I was in the national security organizations, uh, hey, we should make sure we at least stay in the game and ideally stay ahead of them. Exactly. This is the perfect point. We need a, I, we need some type of program to get us back into STEM or something. So no, no, I definitely agree. Um, I just had a random thought. I wonder when NASA was super big during the Cold War, if it led to more people getting into STEM majors because they wanted to like help with our space race and get back at the Russians, you know? And I'm wondering if we make AI a big aspect, we help America like get into STEM, if that would lead to more people coming out with this type of majors. Um, hmm. So let's go. You saw that hilarious point. bit about, I forget her name, but the lady who's in charge of the, was it FTC? complaining yes, about Lena. how people, yeah, Lena Khan using that, using the idea of national security as a reason to let yeah. large tech companies go ahead with these acquisitions. And I was just laughing when she said that, first of all, it came out of nowhere. It was like, it wasn't part of the conversation. She just introduced the idea as if, you know, don't even try to say this as if it was funny. Second, it's a totally reasonable position to take. Of course, national security people are worried that some other country is going to develop a new technology that they will have to deal with on a future battlefield. It doesn't matter if you call it AGI. It could be anything. You know, they're developing yeah. hypersonic missiles. I don't care. If I show up on a battlefield and the, and the enemy has this crazy thing, I'm in bad shape. I should have had a program to develop something that would compete with it. So true. And um, I, I agree with you. We And also, I, I look at it as a shot. She was firing a shot at uh, yes. Mark Andreessen. <laughs> yes. Right. She was trying to She was trying to head off that position. But it came off very, to me, it came off very uh, amateurish. Like, yeah. you introduced it at an odd time. It had nothing to do with the conversation. And second, Thanks. it's easily refuted. Not only is the National Security Organization supposed to worry about that, it's their primary job. Exactly. I, you, I mean, think about it right now. You don't want us to be deployed in the battle and then also be like, oh, we never thought about drones. And now all of our half our forces are gone. Like their yeah. job is to be looking over the horizon. That's what you I want. I mean, that's why DARPA exists, right? And it, it's why the their predecessor, ARPA, created all this uh, all these projects that resulted in the internet. And then they kicked off the self-driving car revolution. I and mean, they've, they've contributed to dozens of these advancements. I we we forget like you know when the atomic bomb was created like we were in America so we were well, we were alive then but it's like we had this amazing technology that would just win battles and mm -hmm. no other country around had that and be like holy shit like without even imagine? having to use it you just yeah. the fact that you owned it and could deliver it I could you I mean I couldn't imagine like if it turned out that the, the, the British had it instead or something and we were sitting here in America and be like. Oh, <laughs> um, we need to get our shit together. Well, also, Anyways, next video. you know, yeah, the, the, the historical context is we show up for World War II and the German weapons are like way beyond ours. Like their tanks were fantastic compared to ours. Right. And, and the they Panzers were playing catch up for pretty much the whole war. 
pretty much. We should go into a talk on that. And also, by the end of the war, they already had jet technology deployed in yes. the air. And our pilots didn't have that. And they had to like – I remember listening to this old guy who was like, yeah, I was in the cockpit. And all of a sudden, I see a whoosh go by me. I'm like, what the hell is that? And it's like, oh, it must be that German tech jet technology. And the only way they could take them down, they said, is if the jets went into a dive, that was the only way they could match their speed. But other mm -hmm. than that, they were completely screwed. And I was thinking to myself like, thank God we got into the war because if they had another year or so to develop a technology and had jets <laughs> in the air – against propeller planes like game over um so let me uh let's go to this in this next clip here for me it's not entirely real because i still have my youtube channel here i'm making another video but what i tapped into was a very real personal fear of becoming completely intellectually and economically irrelevant that is a fear that i was actually carrying and actually you probably noticed over the last couple months there was a kind of an undertone of sarcasm in some of my videos turns out that was me coping with that fear so that was a cope um i'm an entp we cope with everything with sarcasm um okay so um uh, i was gonna i have a wikipedia page i was gonna open up but basically that's him. He's referring to Myers Briggs, and Myers Briggs mm -hmm. is largely regarded in psychology and business as pure quackery. Um, <laughs> the organization that is re research on Myers Briggs is actually part of Myers Briggs, and they release research, and everyone in psychology says it's crap. Um, I think one it's, it's of, the astrology for corporate people. Pretty much. And um, one issue it, it ties into is just like um, fortune telling, it has the Barnum effect. Um, mm -hmm. which is a common psychological phenomenon where right, individuals give high accuracy ratings and descriptions of their personality as supposedly are tailored specifically to them, yet which are in fact vague and general <laughs> enough to apply to a wide range of people, which is kind of how – and I'm not trying to dog this guy, but he does this in his show where he goes, and in the future, we're going to have uh, AI that's going to take over this, that, this, and this, and in the future, things are going to get better. But he never gives real definitive timelines or when he gets – ahead of his skis he then ratches his back his proposal to make it like oh a ai is just going to be like google search ahead of or, his skis is a good that's a good description here I, exactly. I think he's describing a real phenomena though what i think is funny is we went through this period in the in an earlier generation where industrial machines were starting to deliver essentially physical force you know muscle power and so right. people who were really strong and their strength and their endurance was their 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 key selling point were the most threatened by these industrial machines that were created and and operated by a bunch of you know wonky engineers so all of a sudden i'm like the guy who's able to carry around the most steel ingots or or you know drive the most uh wedges for for train rails and suddenly there's this device that you put wood into it, it burns it, produces steam, and somehow pounds these things into place. What the hell? This thing makes me obsolete. It, it goes directly at my uh, key competency. And what he's describing is a real phenomenon because now people who are uh, initially people who are creative and then people who are intellectual, especially you know symbol manipulators, are suddenly threatened by this thing. Like the perfect example of this is Stephen Wolfram, who, you know, is like this genius mathematician, really good businessman, very productive. And he sees these systems doing symbol manipulation and says, wow, that is very powerful. It's getting better very quickly. It's a totally different, almost alien technology compared to what he built with Wolfram Alpha. Alpha. That is a tongue twister. And so to him, he, it was an imperative that he understand it because it directly threatened you know, his core competency and what his business is all about. And so it's kind of sad that Shapiro kind of goes off the rails here because I think this is a real phenomena. I actually think it's coming for creative people first. So true. Um, you made a lot of great points there. And on why we like Wolfram, and we're going to get him on the show on these days, <laughs> is he could have been like, Mm, this is better than what I have. Like Yon Lacoon. Mm, this LM suck. I'm going to go home and go get my chicken tendies and go complain about it on Twitter. Instead, Wolfram was like, no, this is great. And I'm going to jump on these coattails and I'm going to push this thing forward. Hell yeah. Because what I care about is societal progress. I don't care about the other shit. Like, I'm yeah. glad this thing is here to take me to the next level. So yeah, he definitely the turned the lemons into lemonade. Yeah, so that's why he and he jumped on it. So he's like, "I'm the first plug-in, <laughs> me over here." He could yeah, have been. Yeah, he could have. I'm going to integrate my business and try to be there from the start. 
yeah, that's why I have tons of respect for him. Um, so yeah, I agree. And then also, uh, Sam said uh, like a year ago, he was like, a lot of people judge, the, uh, base their egos on their intellectual prowess, which yes. I think is a definitely a mistake. And I mm. think I saw a lot of this at Google for the last like 15, 20 years. People are like, well, I'm from MIT and I'm very smart and blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking to myself, like, when I came in there, I was like, yeah, I'm from a machine shop and I'm a, I wear overalls and I drink from the bidet because I thought it was – that's where I get my <laughs> water. And I always knew that people were, were smarter than me and I just accepted it. But now you have these people who are the one percenters who are that smart and now they're like, wait a minute. These machines can be smarter than me. Then what, what do I – where do I base my yeah. sense of self worth? And that's the that's the concept that Shapiro is trying to describe, but he kind of gets mm -hmm. distracted. It's a real yeah. problem. I mean, it's a real psychological impact. I personally feel like it's going to be huge, but it's not really happening yet on the intellectual side. Where it's happening is on the creative side, and you see the reaction from artists and actors and writers. Like you see, there's a bunch of lawsuits against OpenAI. Uh, a whole collection of creative people. There's a really negative reaction from people at the New York Times. And essentially they're threatened because they see that this thing is potentially capable of generating the same output that they get paid to generate. And to your point, that is how they uh, largely measure their, their productivity and self-worth. In any case, they're going to go after this thing. They're going to try to sue it out of existence. They're going to try to claim that Oh, it only is able to do that because of our data was used for training. And so once this dust settles and their data has been removed from the training and the thing is still able to do what they do really well, some of them are going to pull an alpha, uh, a Wolfram Alpha or a Stephen Wolfram, and they're going to correctly learn to work with it. Like if I was making movies right now, I'd be thinking, you know, sometime in the next decade or two, you're going to be able to hand something to someone that you call a movie, but it customizes itself automatically to that person's interests. Almost the way that a, a world building game does, you know, you go into one of those games like Minecraft and what you experience there depends largely on your own choices because it's really a world model that you get to move around in. Movies aren't like that though. They're a linear story that plays out over time, but they could be more like a game especially if you had something like Sora to sort of auto-generate the video as it played out. And so if I was uh, in that field, that's what I'd be thinking. How do I start making use of these tools? It's kind of hilarious because, uh, what was her name? Christina Laser, the, the lawyer mm -hmm. and teacher that we had on the show? Yeah, shout out to her. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah, she made the point about, and it was a great point, about when photography first started developing. You know, and people who were painters were like freaked out and, oh, it's going to replace us. And let's, let's sue people who produce photographic equipment. But some artists took the opposite approach and said, oh, photography is a new art form. You can take a photo in a very deliberate way. And that is an expression of your art. Exactly. It's so, it, yeah, I know I keep doing that. God damn it. it. No, it's so true. And, um, there are people who adapt to change and do even better. There's a person who did a video, I think it was on Wired or, um, uh, whatever. And he was showing, oh, now, you know, I used to do hand art, but now I use AI to just basically do wireframes on 12 different pieces and I use it to feather in ideas. And now I'm like 12x more productive and I can save more time at home and spend more time mm -hmm. with my family. I'm like, mm -hmm. hell yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what you should be doing right now. Yeah. Um, so that makes sense. Let's, let's go back here real quick. Um, so for that, I apologize, but I did the work. And so I just wanted to give you a quick like recap of what that was like for me. So first, when I acknowledged that like, hey, probably by the end of the year, AI is going to be smarter than me by literally every possible conceivable metric. Identity crisis. I identify as an intellectual. I've always been told how smart I am. So it's like, okay, well, if suddenly the thing that makes me special goes away, who am I? What is my purpose for being? Um, and then that was immediately followed by existential dread, which is if I'm made irrelevant and everyone is made irrelevant, then humanity is irrelevant. A lot of jumps to conclusion here. So mm -hmm. um, one thing that I don't like and I think is a, uh, a, an abnormality of human development is these large mega corporations. Like this is a relatively new thing since the Industrial Revolution that happened. And p we are not used to uh, cooperating in such large institutions to get work done. We used to back in the day. The only people we hung out with were people from our tribes or immediate family or next of kin, and we operated at their house. We ran our homestead, and our value wasn't based upon 
what the human species wasn't derived from the human species. It was derived on one-to-one relationships. And what he's doing is he's trying to make this global argument of like people think about their value as like, how do I compare with 7 billion other people as ants? It's like, no, what you focus on is like, how do I compare to my friend? How what, do I matter to my friends, my family, and my loved ones? If I matter and relationships matter, then I'm okay. You're not constantly thinking about the cosmos and how everything, how everything interacts. So well, I he comes, that was kind of... He- he comes to that point later though, right? He basically says yeah. what really matters is the the relationships that you have and so on. But there's a whole bunch of uh, angst and, and and storming going on leading up to that, which I it seems a little overwrought. Yeah, let's go, let's go to that then too. And that's uncomfortable to reconcile with. And then I entered into a full dark night of the soul, which is like you just kind of collapse inwards and you feel bad. And I actually got sick. You probably hear I'm actually still sick because of like how hard this all hit me. Now, one thing I will see is or say is that on the other side, you realize we were always irrelevant, that every individual human is just like one ant in the colony. You know, we, our, our labor is we, we, you know, bring one little grain of food back to the, back to the colony. And that's pretty much our work. But the colony exists without us. Um, one of the things that, are, that, that was really difficult uh, during my time off as I was going through this dark night of the soul was realizing the rest of the world keeps going without you. And that is always true. Live, die, sick, whether you quit, retire. I was always irrelevant. Um, and there's actually some freedom in that um, and, and a lot of a lot of uh, humility, too. Just like, oh. Okay, you know, I'm just one, one out of eight billion. Great. Um, but then on the other side of recognizing, hey, if we're all gonna, about to become intellectually and economically irrelevant, what we are creating is a successor species. And I ran a poll on this, and 60% of you agreed that we are creating a successor species. 45% said that it's a... Okay, so this is the last clip. Of, I just uh, Thank you for making this, uh, David Shapiro. I really appreciate it. Um, I just want to finish the quick little reading. Um, so 48 Laws, Power, number 27. Play on people's need to believe to create a cult-like following. People have an overwhelming desire to believe in something. Become the focal point of such desire by offering them a cause, a new faith to follow. Keep your words vague but full of promise. Emphasize enthusiasm over rationality and clear thinking. Give your new disciples rituals to perform. Ask them to make sacrifices on your behalf. In the absence of organized religion and grand causes, your new belief system will will, uh, bring your untold power. Let me read a few more paragraphs. Um, In the search... In searching, as you must, for the methods that will gain you the most power for at least effort, you will find the creation of a cult-like following one of your most effective. Having a large following opens up all sorts of possibilities for deception. You might think it's a gargantuan task to create such a following, but in the fact, it's fairly simple. As humans, we have desperately need to believe in something, anything. This makes us eminently gullible. We simply cannot endure long periods of doubt. Dangle in front of uh, us some new cause, elixir, get-rich-quick scheme, or latest technological trend or art movement, and we will leap to the water as one to take take the bait. Look at history. The chronologicals of new trends and cults that have made us a mass following for themselves could fill a library. After a few centuries, a few decades, a few years, a few months, they generally look ridiculous, but the time they seem so attractive, so transcendental, so divine. Um, and then it says... Uh, let's see here. What do I want? Uh, do I'm just raining on the doomers parade here. I know, right? Uh, the, what I was going to say is keep it vague, keep it simple. To create a cult, you must first attract attention. The, uh, this you should do not through actions which are too clear and readable, but through words which are hazy and deceptive. Your initial speeches, conversations, and interviews must include two elements. On one hand, the promise of something great and transformative, and the other hand, total vagueness. And so... Um, and not going after him or anything, but I'm finding in the singularity area and things like that, there's a lot of cult-like tendencies that are happening. And which is really interesting is you get folks here who say, yeah, like I'm super logical and I can't be tricked and, you know, religion's stupid and nationalism's stupid and whatnot, but the singularity is nigh. That's <laughs> and it's right. going to happen soon. And it's going to be man-machine yeah. symbiosis. And because of this, I'm going to sell all my worldly possessions and get put on my 3D goggles and eat popcorn. Yeah, this... This reminds me a lot of the year 2000 crisis, right? I remember people saying, okay, all these computers were designed to have two digits for the year. When the year rolls over, uh, the whole financial system is going to collapse. No transactions will be possible. Uh, And therefore, to your point, I'm selling all my worldly possessions and moving up into the hills with the supply of, you know, pampers and baked beans. And the hilarious part was the year 2000, Everyone saw it coming. I mean, it was one of these slow-moving uh, crises. And so all, they employed a whole bunch of people to go into these ancient systems and fix them so they could handle the year rollover. And I'm sure there was tons of errors when the rollover actually happened. I'm sure there were lots of systems that didn't get fixed in time. But, you know, we figured out how to muddle through, right? And the gist of it was tons of panic. And then when the year actually rolled over, like nothing. Like nothing bad really happened on any kind of scale. 
And I noticed that in this discussion of AGI, the singularity is now way in the distance. Like we now have all these new intermediate goals. We got AGI, then ASI, and then the singularity has somehow moved off further into the future. They used to be one thing. Yeah. And so do you think they're doing that because now they're like trying to like save face and be like, oh, cool. what we thought was a singularity 15, 20 years ago now is actually happening. Society hasn't changed. Now we need to kind of now redefine it again so we can continue with our cult like beliefs. I guess. I mean, maybe just as we get closer, we realize it's totally viable for us to have improving AI systems. I'm, I don't know if they're AGI or not, but they're going to keep improving. And yet society is going to go on. Uh, they're going to make certain jobs obsolete. Yeah, just like previous industrial and agricultural revolutions did. And yet society is going to go on. Now, maybe after a whole bunch of AGI developments, we get to the point where most people don't need current day jobs. Like they're not necessary in those roles. But that's exactly what happened to us in the agricultural revolution. Mm hmm. Yeah, and that's what happened yet, also. Yeah, go ahead. We created all kinds of crazy new jobs and demanded all kinds of new services that we didn't have before. Exactly, and it's also, if you would ask the agricultural, when the agricultural revolution was happening, and they're like, oh, like all the farm jobs are going away, like they didn't have an idea of like what's going to happen next because they couldn't even conceptualize what was going to be the demand. It's You don't know until you get there. So for us to be like, oh, we know what the jobs are going to be, we can't tell you <laughs> until we get there, new opportunities arise in some form. Now it's going to be like, oh, we can apply human and AI towards a new unique niche that's going to lead to more economic opportunities and more jobs for humans. So anyways, uh, thank you, Joe, for this discussion. I hope you all enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. We are doing a members drive. We're trying to get to 100 Patreon supporters by the end of this month. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash Sfic. You get exclusive ad-free episodes on YouTube and Patreon when you support us for five bucks a month. Talk to you later. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye.